Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Sebastian Faber. I am the current chair of the Board of Governors of the Abram Lincoln Brigade Archives. I'm speaking to you from Oberlin, Ohio, where I live and work. Um, and I'm really very pleased to be joined today for this very special event by uh, Peter Carroll and Shannon O'Neill, and later via recorded video by Daniel Nista. Um, I'll be introducing each of these three participants um, before, right before they speak. Um, and I also want to thank uh, Dennis Meany and Mark Wallen um, at the ABBA office. Mark is our executive director, Dennis our executive assistant. And Dennis, as usual, will be running behind the scenes, um, fielding your questions. Um, just before we get started, a couple of household um, communications. The first is that, as usual, um, we are recording this event for uh, if you want to rewatch it later. Um, we'll be giving some practical advice on how to consult the collection. So reviewing might be a handy thing to be able to do. In, in about 24 hours, we'll put this up on our YouTube channel. Um, so people who didn't attend can review it or you can watch it again. But that also means that if you don't want your face to be part of the recording, it's a good idea to turn your camera off. Um, throughout the event, feel free to post any questions that you have to the chat. And then uh, once we get to the Q&A, toward the end of the uh, the last third of, of the hour, um, Dennis will curate the questions and will ask, will allow anybody who wants to, to pose their own question. Or if you prefer not to do that, he can pose the question for you to um, Peter or to Shannon. So, um, I think that's all I wanted to say. Um, let me also remind you that this event is free, but ALBA is a 501c3 nonprofit. So if you feel compelled to donate to ALBA, um, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, Dennis just posted the link to the chat. Uh, we can only do this thanks to your generous support. Um, so thank you for attending and thank you for your generous support of our work. Um, so let's get started. Um, just to give you a sense of what we're going to do here, uh, we're going to start with uh, Peter Carroll, who's going to tell us in a summarized version of how the archive came to be and how it ended up at NYU, where it's currently. Then we're going to watch an eight-minute uh, video by Danielle Nista, who's the assistant university archivist at NYU, which will explain, will give you a set, will show you the uh, the new home of the archive of the Tamment Library and the ALBA collection and walk you through practical steps to consult the collection online. And then we'll hand it over to Shannon O'Neill, the curator of the, uh, the Tam and Wagner collections at NYU, who will then give a live presentation about the collection. So that's kind of, and then we'll, we'll, we'll open it up to Q&A. So um, to start out, I'm happy to introduce uh, Peter Carroll, um, who's been the heart and soul of ALBA, of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade Archives for, I'm gonna say 40 years. Um, he has been, he was chair for a long time. Um, he wrote the authoritative history of the Lincoln Brigade in Spain called the Odyssey of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, uh, still in print from Stanford uh, University Press. And um, together with uh, myself, uh, we co-edit the volunteer, our quarterly magazine. And I'll be posting a couple of links from the volunteer to interviews with Peter and with Shannon that we published in the past couple of years. So uh, Peter, take it away. How, what's the history of the archive as we currently know it? Well, it, it's a little chaotic as you would expect from people who were individualists and went to Spain without any uh, clear reasons that, uh, of knowing each other maybe perhaps and so forth. and. It is uh, the archive, of course, comes from mostly those who survived the war, who were not killed in Spain, and uh, hung around together in what they created as the veterans of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, VALB, V A L B, which was a, a, a very selected organization. Uh, they had uh, rivalries within it from time to time including from the very beginning almost what to do with their archives, with their papers. 
what should we do with this junk, they said. And uh, one of the people who's really, you know, no one really talks about him, his name was David McKelvey White. He was the son of a former governor of Ohio, which gave him some kind of organizational identity. He had been a veteran of the Lincoln Brigade, wounded and returned um, in the middle of the war, and then became the leader of another organization called the Friends of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, FALB. And that was an independent organization that ran um, publicity in favor of the Spanish Republic, uh, that uh, did work on the welfare of volunteers, families of volunteers, um, widows, orphans, things like that. It was a, a politically oriented, but still a social, you know, organization. Ironically, and this is something I have pieced together, not so clearly in my own mind, was uh, McKelvey White uh, died in 1945. A sad death because uh, he committed suicide, and partly because he was gay and had been criticized for his gayness by Communist Party officials. McKelvey White had been the custodian de facto of a lot of material, especially the PR stuff that um, had been generated during the Spanish Civil War in New York as the headquarters. Um, and his papers were given and donated to the New York Public Library. All of that was given to them. And some of that archive is still there as the David McKelvey White collection. But again, in the post-World War II period, and this is stuff I've heard, uh, an oral tradition maybe and may not be completely accurate, so take it with a grain of salt. The library apparently in the McCarthy period didn't think this stuff was significant to keep and destroyed a lot of the original material. They just discarded it. Um, I have found in that library some bound uh, volumes, very thick volumes of the uh, PR that had been conducted by the FALB and the VALB during the Spanish War. And they are Xeroxes of original papers. But I don't know if, the, and it's only Xeroxes, I don't know if there was other material like posters and material like that that was simply thrown out. People talked about it, but I could have no evidence that it's true. In any case, there was no central place to put stuff. The, the, the vets themselves hoarded material. I'm sure their families save letters from Spain uh, in great numbers, but nobody was actually curating this particular thing, except for an archivist at Brandeis University named Victor Birch. It was a slight man. He was about, I don't know, five feet five, maybe. Uh, but an assiduous researcher, very, very skilled, uh, prominent in the um, collection of odd magazines and, and uh, strange popular items of American culture. And he began asking the vets to send this stuff to Brandeis. And again, they were hesitant, you know, to do so. First of all, these were intimate letters from Spain. Many of them were documents. The FBI was chasing after the veterans at the same time. They didn't want to expose themselves. If you ask too many questions, they turn their backs and say, you know, go find somebody else to talk to. And uh, so it wasn't exactly easy, but Birch was persistent and a good man and, and very sympathetic. So he became the place where the VALB office in New York sent most of their early archives and they were curated at Brandeis University. Meanwhile, around the country, people, some veterans never heard of the VALB, never heard of the New York office, certainly never heard of Victor Birch. So someone would, uh, would die or say, you know, he had these papers, 
and they would make donations maybe to a local library. I mean, among the libraries that still have stuff are the University of California at Berkeley, the University of Washington, Adelphi University on Long Island, um, University of Illinois, which got into a competition between uh, certain board members of ALBA and certain board members that, that were identified with the Illinois thing. In any case, Brandeis became the largest collection and the one that was most inviting because most of the vets came out or many of the vets came from East Coast cities rather than from the Midwest and the Far West. Um, in 1979, when the, let's say the average age of a veteran would have been maybe 75 years of age, um, or if they were, who was alive, I mean, um, they began to realize they had to take care of their material. And, and a small coterie of uh, non-communist vets organized the Abraham Lincoln Brigade archives, chartered by New York State as an educational institution. And that's the core of what developed. Um, Alba continued to do its activities. When people had old stuff, they donated it to Alba or directly to Brandeis. The collection at Brandeis was never sold to, to Brandeis. The Alba claimed ownership of the collection up until, you know, beginning around 1986. Anything that Brandeis had before 1986 belonged to Brandeis. So the legal work, you know, uh, turned out to, to uh, explain that. But Brandeis simply didn't have the resources to curate the, the size of the archive. They, they were very uh, slow and, and inadequate, and everybody knew it, including their own librarian. And so Alba be, it, it began a search that I, I guess I was chair of the board and led the, led the search for an alternative archive that could be an institution that could manage to do what had to get done. Um, we had uh, offers from the University of California at San Diego, which has a huge Spanish Civil War collection, but not about the Lincoln Brigade. They wanted it very much. Stanford University had a, a competing offer. Uh, the University of Illinois withdrew its offer because the curator there had a friend who was at New York University and they didn't want to become rivals over this whole thing. And finally, we had to have a vote about the board members of ALBA, we had a very intense series of meetings and finally called it a vote. And almost everybody agreed that NYU was the place to move the material. We did have to leave behind uh, several things, uh, several valuable items, uh, mostly posters uh, and artwork to at Brandeis, but they agreed to make copies of material and we took away the, the originals. That by that time that included the Russian archives that we had microfilm uh, that we had gotten in, in, in the 1990s. And uh, we moved it to, um, we transferred it to NYU. We sold it to NYU and uh, NYU owns the archive, right? All those pieces of paper. And uh, the, the immense task of, of organizing that material, all those boxes and folders and everything, not to mention the digitization uh, that has occurred since the year 2000, um, you know, the amount of effort and lovingness that people at the NYU library had in special collections, Tamman, you know, really turned this into an, an amazing, amazing thing. Everything we promised them had turned out to be true. Yes, people would come. They would be very interested. It's, I, Shannon, you can answer this. I mean, is it the most used archive of uh, of Tamman, as rumors have it? Yeah, or, it, it's it's very high up <laughs> in our used collections for sure. I, it's yeah. one of our. It's the one of the collections that I teach the most with, which I'll talk about in a little bit too. Yeah, I mean, it it's a wonderful, magnificent salvage work. It would this stuff could have been lost so easily. I mean, 
you you can't imagine how many people threw away stuff too late, you know, too soon to, to, that we missed from getting into the thing. And the jealousies of various archivists who really thought they could split the collection a little bit, because why not have a few letters here and a few letters there when they, you know, could have been all in one place. Anyway, that's that's my wrap. Thank you and, so much, Peter. Yeah. Okay. Take care. <laughs> we'll we'll call you back for the Q and A later. Um, <laughs> there are some questions here. Um, so next up, we'll uh, watch this short video that um, was made by Danielle Nista, who is currently the un assistant university archivist at NYU. Um, and she made this during the um, the quarantine of the pandemic. So there may be a reference or two to the quarantine, but that no longer applies. The, the as Shannon will say in a second, uh, the uh, the uh, Tamman is open for business again uh, in its new digs, which are really beautiful. So, uh, Dennis, if you want to queue up Danielle Nista's video, um, this is also available on YouTube as a separate video, um, but we'll, we thought it would be useful to play it here because a lot of um, you can see the archive and it and explains how to consult the online catalog. on the second floor of the Bolts Library. We're currently close to in-person researcher visits, but we are accepting remote reference and reproduction of materials requests. Normally, if you were to come to visit us, you'd enter through the doors here and into our check-in area. Once here, you'll notice that you're standing in a gallery space with additional wings on your right and also on your left. Straight ahead, we have the check-in desk where one of our student workers would check you in and give you instructions about what materials need to go into the locker and where to sit in the reading room. Then you'd head over here to the lockers to put away your belongings before you head into the reading room, which is right through this door. Here we are now in the special collections reading room. You'll notice how large this room is. We can accommodate up to 24 appointments normally with two people at each table. There's plenty of room to spread out. The tables are all numbered so that researchers know where to sit and staff can keep track of what items are checked out to which table. We have two reference desks where staff sit to assist researchers with handling materials, moving on to the next box or folder, and to answer any general reference questions that may come up in the course of research. I'm going to walk you through how to search for archival materials in the archival search portal. First. Navigate to specialcollections.library.nyu.edu. On the left side of the page, you'll have the option to filter by repository, including the three repositories that make up NYU Special Collections. We have the Tamament Library and Robert F. Wagner Labor Archives, the Fales Library and Special Collections, and New York University Archives. You'll also notice that there are a few other NYU libraries and special collections you can search, such as the Poly Archives and NYU Abu Dhabi Special Collections. There are also some non-NYU libraries, like New York Historical Society and Brooklyn Historical Society. Make sure that you check which repository a collection is part of so you go to the correct reading room to view it. In the center of the screen, you'll see a search box where you can put names, places, subjects, material types, or any other keywords. Most of the materials related to the Spanish Civil War have a call number that starts with the code ALBA, which stands for Abraham Lincoln Brigade Archives. Let's try typing that in and see what we find. As you can see, we've got over 10,000 hits related to ALBA because the search portal is pulling up information about collections and specific folders. That's a lot of material to go through. When you're doing your research, try to be as specific as possible. For example, if I wanted to find out more about journalists covering the Spanish Civil War, I can make my search more narrow by adding in the Boolean operator N plus the word journalist. Wow, that really narrowed down our results. Now there's only 24 hits to go through. That's way more manageable. As I scroll through the results, I can start to look at the abstract of the collection to see if any materials are related to my research. The abstract is right here underneath the titles. 
Let's go back and look at the George Marion papers because those look like they might be relevant. Once I click on the title, a new window opens up. This is a finding aid, and it's a way of reviewing a collection without actually looking at the boxes. The finding aid can help me determine if there's information I want to look at. It's important to know that the finding aid is not a digitized version of the collection. Instead, it's a tool that archivists create to give a general overview of what's inside a collection. The first page of the finding aid gives a broad look at the collection. Here, you'll find the title, the call number, um, where you can find where the collection is located, and information about the archivist who processed this collection. There's also information about the creator of the collection, the dates that the collection includes, an abstract for a full summary about the collection itself, as well as the quantity of materials. The quantity tells you how much material is here. One linear foot is about the size of a banger's box. A collection that is one linear foot stored in two boxes means that each box is a manuscript box. You can always reach out to an archivist for more information about the size of a collection. There's also some additional information about what language the materials are recorded in. If you want more information about the collection, look to the table of contents. There's a lot of great information here, and we can break down what each of these headings mean. The descriptive summary is the page that we're on now, with the broadest overview of the collection. The historical and biographical note puts the collection in context. It helps answer questions like, who was this person? Where did they live? When did they create these records? What else was going on in the world that influenced the creation of these records? Sometimes this page will include sources that the archivist used when writing the historical note. You can also consult them for your own research. The scope and contents and arrangement tab um, explains how the archivist organized and arranged the collection. It also tells you more about the types of materials you can find within the collection and within each series. This can be helpful if you know you're looking for a certain type of material instead of or in addition to particular content. The Access Points tab lists some specific search terms that the archivist thought represented the main themes of the collection. These are based on the Library of Congress subject headings, and you can use them as keywords in searches on both the archival search portal and the library catalog to find related materials. You can find information about access restrictions, use for publication restrictions, and the preferred citation all on the administrative information tab. This tab also can include information about previous owners or caretakers for the collection under the provenance note, as well as related material within NYU Special Collections and material that was separated during processing. Finally, the container list and the accompanying series will give you a list of the boxes and folders contained in this collection. Remember, this is not a digitized version of the folder. Rather, it gives you a title and the dates of the materials to help you determine whether or not this is useful for your research. If you think it is, make sure to note down the boxes and folders so you can remember what you need to request later on. If you follow the link to request materials using your Special Collections Research account, Normally, you are able to schedule an appointment to view these items in the reading room. However, we are currently operating on a limited schedule due to the COVID-19 pandemic, so please reach out to special.collections at nyu.edu for more information about how to request materials instead. Thank you all so much for listening to this introduction to NYU Special Collections. So this was super practical and useful. I hope you um, agree with that. I, I, every time I see this, I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. Um, I'm gonna post um, a, a link here um, to an article we, we ran in the volunteer that shows you what uh, collections have all been digitized and are available online, audio, video, and photographs and posters. Um, and then, um, I think we'll go on now and I'm gonna introduce Shannon O'Neill. Um, we're super pleased that Shannon can join us. Shannon is extremely busy 
because uh, she and her small staff uh, have to serve many requests from <laughs> us as well for digitization and scanning and 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 records and all that. And they do an amazing job. So uh, Shannon became the curator of the Tam and Wagner uh, Wagner collections at NYU in 2019. Um, uh, she previously worked at Barnard College, the LA Public Library, and Atlantic City Free Public Library. And uh, she's been a great ally of ALBA. And um, take it away, Shannon. Thanks, Sebastian. Um, so I'm going to share my screen with everybody. All right. Um, so I just want to start by saying thank you to Mark and Sebastian and Dennis and Cole and Maria and Peter and Josie and everyone um, at ALBA for all of your coordination and facilitation to make this happen. Um, and thank you especially to Peter for giving such a wonderful intro. I feel like every time I hear Peter um, speak, my understanding of the ALBA collections expands. Um, so I'm really quite humbled to be a part of this event with him. Um, I also want to thank Danielle um, for sharing her video with us. Um, as we said before, um, Danielle's now the assistant university archivist um, in the NYU University Archives, but for more than five years before that, um, she was a reference associate supporting research and pedagogy across our collections. And she has an incredible amount of knowledge and expertise with our Spanish Civil War records and the Abraham Lincoln Brigade um, collections in particular. And when I first started at NYU, it was really she that guided me through some of my first interactions with the, um, with the materials. I'm really grateful to her. So um, Danielle created this video that we just watched during the quarantine period of the pandemic when access to our spaces was limited solely to staff, um, but we are now fully open again. Um, and at the end of the presentation, I'll reiterate how you can access the collections and we're really hoping that you will pay us a visit. Um, and just to set some additional contexts, NYU Special Collections formally went live as a department in 2019. And as a department, um, NYU Special Collections is the home to three distinct collections, the Tammament Library and Robert F. Wagner Labor Archives, of which the ALBA collections are a part, the Fales Library and Special Collections, and the NYU University Archives. So um, prior to um, the formation of of special collections. If you visited the ALBA collections, uh, you probably went to the 10th floor of Boke's library. Um, and this 10th floor space is now um, the home to a department called Archives Collections Management, or ACM. And they are the team that are responsible for all of the archival processing um, of our collections. Um, and archival processing means the physical arrangement, arrangement of the materials and the describing of the materials um, through finding aids like we were just looking at with um, Danielle. Um, and Danielle showed us the gallery space and the reading room, but I wanna show you a couple other um, behind the scenes new spaces as well. Um, so this, is, this picture here is a peek through the doors um, on the third floor. So the entirety of the third floor of Bope's library, so directly above me in Special Collections, so Special Collections is the second floor, um, the third floor has been completely renovated into um, an archival storage facility. Um, so it has its own temperature and humidity control, and it utilizes these high-density compact um, storage shelving in order to maximize the space. Um, collection material is actively being moved onto the third floor, and this is a huge feat um, that's being coordinated by the head of special collections, Charlotte Priddle, and our collections manager, Felix Esquivel. Um, in fact, TAMM materials that are still on the 10th floor of the library, um, inclusive of some ALBA collections, are going to be moving down to, to our new third floor space starting next week. Um, in the renovation, we were also afforded the opportunity to construct some new pedagogical spaces. Um, these are really beautiful classrooms that are just for teaching with special collections. They're modular, they can be configured into a number of different setups to invite different learning experiences. 
Um, and some of you may have been to one of our classroom spaces in 2019 um, when we were holding events there. Uh, the largest of the three classrooms can be converted to like a small scale meeting space for programming and can seat up to 45 people. And during the semester, our classrooms are jam packed. So between the three repositories, at least one of these classrooms is being utilized nearly every day of the week. Um, and some of the materials, I, I think I said this at the outset, some of the materials that I teach with the most are um, our Spanish Civil War and ALBA collections. And I think many of us joining here today are familiar with the ALBA collections to one degree or another, but for those of us who are new to them, um, I'll introduce a few collection highlights um, before moving into a deeper dive of a collection that I find particularly moving. Um, so there are 223 ALBA collections that are currently open for research, and as Danielle showed in her video, there are more than 10,000 um, folders and objects within those 223 collections. So the sizes of these collections can vary. Um, there are some collections that only have one or two folders of letters, and then there are photograph collections containing literally thousands of negatives. Um, and yeah, so they have a, a, there's a really wide range of formats across the collections too, everything from letters and photographs to audio and moving images to posters like um, Peter was speaking about, um, to postcards, to ephemera and artifacts. And I'm gonna take us through a little tour of some of these materials. Um, as we might expect um, in a collection uh, where many of the materials are created on the battlefield, um, letters abound um, in the collections. So um, here is a copy of a letter written um, by James Lardner to his mother. Uh, Lardner was raised in Greenwich, Connecticut and Great Long Neck Island. He was a journalist. He came from a rather prominent family who counted amongst th their friends, um, F. Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald, Dorothy Parker, H.L. Mencken. Um, Lardner graduated from Andover and Harvard, and he followed Ernest Hemingway and Vincent Sheehan um, to Barcelona. And while he was in Barcelona, he witnessed an aerial attack on the Ebro River in 1938. Um, and following that experience, he felt compelled to immediately join the brigades. Um, so in this letter, uh, he's describing his changing experience um, to like the, the, sorry, his changing appearance um, to his mother, um, you know, the effects of being on the battlefield. He's talking about, um, he, he's getting tan, he's uh, recently shaved his head, he's losing weight. Um, and he writes this letter to his mother, um, in fact, just two months before he's killed in action. And something that I think a lot um, about is how some of these materials in our collections are created in the months or weeks or days just before a soldier died and how many of these documents like this letter are often um, that person's last record um, of their life. And um, I find that really really quite moving. And there's a certain kind of affective experience of being with these collections um, because of that. And my colleague, um, Amrat Khan, who's a graduate student worker in special collections, wrote a really lovely piece about the materiality of this letter. Um, and that's up on our departmental blog um, called The Back Table. Uh, there are countless photographs in the collections. Um, sometimes these are uh, one-off photos that are, you know, tucked in, in and amongst letters in a folder. However, there are a number of sizable photograph collections, two of the largest being the Frederica Martin photograph collection, in which there are something like 4,000 negatives. Um, and then the Harry Randolph 15th International Brigade Films and Photographs, which has a, around 2,000 negatives. And so these are some images from the Harry Randolph collection. Um, on the left, we have John Robinson and Langston Hughes, along with someone um, who I believe is identified as Fuentes. And then on the right, we see Otto Reeves and Frank Alexander of the Mackenzie Papineau Battalion. And, you know, I don't know if it's because this collection has been digitized, um, but I also think it has something to do with the richness of the documentation. 
And the Harry Randall collection is one of our like most frequently requested ALBA collections. Um, and it documents the daily life of the volunteers, but it also documents um, the lives of people living in Spain in wartime, including various political assemblies and everyday life and in towns and villages. And um, here we have an image of nurses of the 15th Brigade. Um, some of the materials that are most frequently requested by faculty at NYU um, for use in their classrooms um, are the posters of which there are more than 200 in the collection. And um, when I'm teaching archival research methodologies, I'll often talk about archival research as a practice of noticing. And I think that there's so much to notice within the posters um, typographically, artistically, politically and socially. Um, we, the students and I will often talk about how, you know, looking at the photograph, uh, not the photograph, sorry, the poster, um, how the poster might have been hung on a wall in Spain. We talk about um, the creases in the posters and seeing um, where and how the poster might have been folded up in order to be shipped home. Um, and that often leads to this really interesting conversation um, about what it means or what it meant for um, the soldiers to be documenting um, like a moment of crisis as it's unfolding and how they had the presence of mind um, in spite of all of the horrors of war that they were experiencing to understand that what they were participating in was significant and world changing and that they needed to document it. Um, and I just find that to be really powerful. Um, there are numerous artifacts and ephemera in the collections, and I often think about artifacts and ephemera as being most appropriately housed in museum, in museum collections, but um, I find that, you know, coupled with the letters and the photographs and the posters, um, that the ephemera and artifacts in the collection really give a sense of tangibility and tactile experience to understanding Spanish Civil War history. Um, what we're looking at here is not uh, necessarily an artifact. It's a published book, um, Estampas, which um, many of us might be quite familiar with. Um, it's held by numerous libraries across the country. Um, and it was a book that collected together paintings of the Spanish Civil War with some explanatory text in Spanish. French and English, and it was produced um, by the Offices of Propaganda of the National Confederation of Workers and also the Iberian Anarchist Federation. But what kind of transforms it from me from being just a publication into something more artifactual um, is this. Um, so one of our copies, and we have several, we have several copies of this book across our collections, but one of our copies exists within the Aubrey Kirby Kelly papers. Um, and unique um, to this copy is that Aubrey had his fellow soldiers sign it. Um, so it becomes this kind of a, like a yearbook, but more than a yearbook, it becomes almost a kind of a memorial. And it's really interesting to see, you know, where people are hailing from, you know, there's folks signing from Seattle and San Francisco and Chicago, Kansas City, Dayton, Ohio, Brooklyn, Winnipeg. Um, and it's just, it's really, it's, you know, you can spend a lot of time just sitting um, with these names and where they're from and, you know, what battalions they're fighting with. Um, and it becomes this like really interesting um, network map of relationships of people that um, Aubrey, Aubrey knew. Um, and here we have a piece of Jim Persoff's uniform. And speaking of networks of um, people and kind of the, um, uh, closeness and intimacies of these collections. I think I might have seen a member of the Persa family in the audience. So hello. Um, and yeah, and this is what I mean about um, the intimacies of these collections. There's a really incredible community surrounding them. Um, so speaking to this uh, piece of this uniform, you know, as soldiers are they're taking up arms outside of the bounds of the of the U.S. military. Um, so in like a contemporary sense, I feel like the Lincoln Brigades took up something that like I would identify as a do-it-yourself or DIY ethic. Um, and here we see um, Jim has painted onto his uniform. And, um, you know, I look at these small, like very delicate 
at brush strokes and just seeing the like care and pride he was taking to paint the international brigades insignia on his uniform. Um, and then to the right, I don't, I don't know who, um, to whom this wallet belonged, um, but there's something about this wallet that I find really moving. Um, and I think it's because I imagine what it might have contained. I could imagine it, it holding a letter from home or perhaps a photograph of a loved one. Um, and maybe this wallet lived in the front pocket or pocket um, of a of a soldier's uniform and was maybe kept, you know, close to their heart. Um, here are a pair of train tickets for travel to Barcelona, and um, I don't actually know what um, you know the holes on the train tickets indicate. I'm not sure if that means that the traveler made a round trip. Um, uh, or, or and was maybe able to make it back, you know, from their destination back to where they started. Um, but we know we know that many people did not um, make it back. Um, and while you know these holdings of the collections, like Peter was saying um, earlier, are, are it's a massive, it's a huge collection. Um, again, what I find so moving is this uh, notion of closeness or intimacy um, within the collections. There really documents of camaraderie, documents of solidarity, and documents of great sacrifice of lives that were lived and lost. Um, one of those lives was Meredith Sidner Graham, also known as Sid, and this is Sid. Um, this is uh, the passport photograph um, that was from the Alba Volunteer Directory database. Um, so this passport photograph was taken in 1937, and in this picture, Sid is around 23 years old. He's a member of the Communist Party, a member of the Artist Union. He's employed as a graphic artist. Um, and the ALBA volunteer directly identifies Sid as living at 32 Cornelia Street, and that's data that was taken from his passport. So 32 Cornelia Street um, is five blocks from where I'm currently sitting. It's about a seven minute walk. Um, so while there's this like emotional affective experience and closeness um, and intimacy in this collection, there's also this really um, fascinating, especially being in New York City and so many um, of the brigadists coming from New York City, this geographical intimacy um, uh, in working with this collection for me as well. Um, Cornelia Street is a street that I walk by or on nearly every day. Um, there are days, you know, when it's warm out and I need to stretch my legs and pick up, <laughs> I've got my iced tea right here. You know, I'll pick up my iced tea and I'll, and I'll take a walk over to Sid's house. Um, I'll take a walk over to 32 Cornelia Street. And in spite of, you know, what little I know about Sid's life, um, I like have this real deep sense of indebtedness to him. Um, Sid was an extraordinary artist. And during his brief time in Spain, he filled notebooks and loose pages with sketches. Often they're like these slice of life um, drawings. Um, he's traveling through Catalonia. He's seeing the campesinos. He's witnessing villagers in their villages. Um, uh, that they are at times, Sid had a good sense of humor. Um, so here we see that Sid has drawn an outhouse that says feed Franco here. Um, <laughs> and above the drawing, it says IB or International Brigade's bathroom. Um, and at other times, Sid's drawings are, are, are somewhat harrowing. And we see Sid working through some strategies for protection when he and his fellow soldiers are under fire you know, seeking um, refuge in the foliage of trees or behind stone walls or in cornfields. Um, he makes note of this occupied house that has holes in its roof, um, likely from due to shelling. Um, and on the right, uh, Sid illustrates in really great detail, detail this experience of the trenches. You know, explosions are ripping through the background. We see soldiers wielding their bayonets, um, a machine gunner with eyes um, at the scope. Um, and I'm going to come back to this image in just a few 
Um, Because I want to first point out that, you know, in his sketches, it's clear that Sid is observing the political iconography around him and like absorbing the graphic imagery, um, a lot of like which we saw in the posters earlier. Um, And he's also trying his own hand at some, you know, political messaging himself, um, which makes me often wonder, you know, who Sid would have become had he made it home? You know, could he have been another Hugo Gellert or the next William Gopper? Um, So just returning back to this image from the trenches, one of the reasons that I find this drawing so harrowing is not just that it's a combat scene, um, but because of this figure at the center, the soldier who's holding the field glasses, Um, And perhaps what this figure unknowingly foretells. Um, I've wondered from, you know, I've wondered time and time again if that figure was perhaps a self portrait. Um, So, like James Lardner and so many others, Sid was killed in combat. And there's a passage in Albin Ragner's memoir um, that marks Sid's death. And Albin writes um, To the south of us, a threat arose. We ate quickly and set off along the riverbanks in an all night march. We reached some hills and along the crest where trenches were, um, were occupied. We relieved a company of Spanish troops at this area. We had no breakfast that morning, but at noon, some food arrived by mules. Sidney Graham of New York and I were given field glasses, one pair, and told to watch. I watched for about 15 minutes and handed them to Sidney. A minute later, he fell to the bottom of the trench dead. He had a bullet hole in his forehead. I realized it could have been me. So I often think again, you know, back to this theme of closeness. I um, think about Albin's closeness to Sid and witnessing Sid's death and realizing it that it could have been himself. Um, and I've often wondered, you know, were Albin and Sid friends? Was it Albin who saved Sid's n- notebooks and brought them back to us? Um, and I think a lot about, you know, what it means for me in 2023 to, to hold Sid's notebooks in my hands. Um, and when I teach with them, I remind the students that Sid was 23 years old, um, probably about the same age as them um, or very close in age to them. And I tell them that Sid lived at 32 Cornelia Street and I encourage them, you know, to go past his house and to feel how close he lived to where we are now. So if you're in New York City, I hope you'll go past 32 Cornelia Street and think about Sid as well. Um, I hope you'll also stop by the Kimmel Windows on LaGuardia Place to see an exhibit that was curated by um, Danielle and Professor Miriam Basilio, along with some students in a class that Miriam and Danielle co-taught. The exhibit looks at a lot of the kinds of materials we looked at today, so visual materials and how they document um, and influence public opinion um, around the Spanish Civil War. And if you go to the exhibit, you'll notice that there is a page from Sid's notebooks that have been incorporated into it. And you know, maybe you can make a day trip out of it. Maybe you can also stop by the collections as well. So you can book an appointment. Um, all you have to do is create a researcher account with us. If you don't yet have one, you can create one. Um, for free at aon.library.nyu.edu. And once you have an account, um, similar to how Danielle showed us in her video, you'll search for a collection, you'll find relevant material, you can then request um, that material to your account using the link on the left that says click here to request materials. Um, You then just fill out a, a form about the materials you want to see and you choose an appointment date on the calendar. Um, and then you'll have a, an appointment booked with us and one of my coworkers will follow up with you. Um, so I've been thinking a lot to you about the future of these collections and um, work is currently underway to prepare a large scale digitization project to scan the first 50 years of the volunteer. Um, right now the issues are, are being cataloged. So there's a lot of preparatory work that has to happen before digitization work can begin. Um, and right now they're with the my colleague Sally Wil- Wilcox, who's doing the cataloging of the issues that we're going to scan. Um, and I'm really excited to um, hand these off to the digital library and technology services here to um, to get, you know, to make these things more accessible. I've also been thinking about um, the fact that we're 
um, rapidly approaching, it seems far away, but we're rapidly rapidly approaching a time in which um, copyright or any kind of um, rights around collections will expire and collections will enter into the public domain. And so I'm curious about what kinds of larger scale digitization we might want to consider and um, how we can begin planning for that together, knowing that that's on the horizon. Um, so yeah, in closing, I just want to say, um, again, express my gratitude, especially for the work that ALBA does to promote social activism and defense of human rights. Um, I hope that we can find constant inspiration from the anti-fascist activism of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade and be reminded of our, you know, of our own closeness, of our own collective power. Um, and yeah, I just want to say thank you all for coming today and for being committed to knowing and learning from this history together and for sharing our knowledge with one another. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Shannon. It's so, so interesting. Um, and I, I, as I said earlier, it's great to have an, 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 a like-minded ally at the helm at the Tamament that makes things much easier even though we're all bound by material and time constraints always. Um, let's open it up to the Q&A. Um, Dennis, you, uh, you have some questions for us. Yes, thank you, Sebastian. So um, for those not familiar with our, um, what we usually do during this section of our events is um, we take questions from the audience. I've been looking at all your questions in the chat and I have um, moved through them a little bit. Uh, I can, I'm going to call on individuals whose questions I picked and they can ask the question themselves if they feel comfortable doing so. I'll allow you, uh, you to unmute your mic. If you don't feel comfortable doing so, that's also fine. Then I will ask the question. So I'm going to go and pick uh, a first question. This had to do with um, accessing a, well, we can talk about it, accessing a non-digitized collection. So Eleanor Hirschberg, if you'd like to ask the question you asked in the chat, you can do so now. Oh, thank you. Um, my mother was a nurse um, in during the war in 1937, and um, so I, and Frederica Martin was her friend, and I wanted to know how to access the photos because I bet my mother's in some of them, and I do have some photos that I was given years ago. I love that, Eleanor. Um, I'm sure I'm certain she's in the photograph, so I'm going to put a link. Um, to the Frederica Martin photograph collection into the chat. Um, so this is the um, finding aid for this collection. Um, so Eleanor, you can, um, on the left under the container list, you could perhaps um, browse through some of the description of the collection and um, see if there's a particular um, photograph or a folder that seems like it could perhaps contain a, fo a photograph of um, your mother. And um, if you see something that's of perhaps of interest to you, you could create a special collections researcher account and request a reproduction of that image. Um, you can always send me an email. I'm, I'm always happy to do um, what I call just like quick sort of like, is this the person? So, so it's not uncommon for people to reach out to me and say like, can you just look in this folder and I'll take a quick like cell phone snapshot and send it back to you and confirm if it's the right image or not. Um, and then I, I can help support you putting through a more formal reproduction request. Um, but you can also come and see um, the materials in, in person if you're local or if you're visiting in New York City. Um, and again, to do that, you'll just create a researcher account with us, request materials and an appointment date, and we'll be happy to set that up. Okay. And your email address is? Sure, I'll put that in the chat too. It's okay. sm like mom o like ostrich 224 at nyu.edu. Thank you. She was in Alba Seti and Bel Alcazar. I know. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you so much for that. Um, I know we only have time for a few more questions, so I'm going to go ahead and um, call on. Uh, this is a question about um, that may or may not be able to be answered here. 
um, about the materials that we have acquired and have not acquired through the Russian State Archives. Um, Lewan Jones, if you'd like to ask your question, you can do so now. Hi, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, I used the collection recently to look for some photographs for a documentary film project, and I uh, got to the point where um, some of the photos just weren't in your collection. Um, and so I was just wondering about what what things are in Russia, whether they're cop, you know, whether there's a parallel collection, whether it's a different collection, and also um, what things are possibly only on microfilm and not in actual, you know, negative, for instance, with photographs, negatives or hard copies or things like that. That's a really great question. I don't know the answer to it, but Peter, do you have a, a sense of this? Yeah, when uh, when we were bringing stuff over on microfilm from Russia, they it wasn't clear what they weren't giving us. We got what we got, and um, in fact, they there were some, as I recall, there were some objections to sending some material or whatever. But I think we got most of them, and uh, for what they had, I know that they they were originally uh, just sent to Brandeis and then transferred to NYU, so they should have whatever they have. I don't know how else you'll find. Hmm. There is the online index. There was an online index. I don't know that it's been translated into English, but that is in a digitized form on the internet. So the the one thing that I, I can answer that is I think uh, there's about a thousand images, a thousand forty eight images that were selected from the Moscow archives that are have been digitized. Some of them have been digitized and are at the Tamament uh, and available online. If you go to the Argaspi um, archive in, in Moscow online, there's a large list of photographs that are not available digitally. So the, most of the International Brigade archive is has been scanned. Most of the documents have been scanned, available as, as just as image files, but the photographs are not. So I think that I think the 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 this discrepancy between what's at the TAM and what's still in Moscow should be you should be able to derive that by comparing the lists of the photographs that you can see the entries for but not mm -hmm. the actual um images versus these these a little over a thousand were selected um as, as the moscow are moscow negatives i think they're called mm -hmm. uh, I, i'll post a link to that to those digitized images for the i mean i'm sure Levan, you, you know it but yeah. for those people that haven't seen that thank you sure thing Thanks, Sebastian and, and Peter. I love the I love this like collective <laughs> sharing of knowledge. And there, somebody wrote me a direct message in the chat too that I just want to bring to the floor, which is um, David Grant let me know that a train conductor would punch the twi the ticket twice um, so that it could not be reused. Um, so thank you for sharing that, David. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, that was that was great. Um, I think uh, we're coming up on the hour, but maybe we have time for one more question. Um, I think um, if you, I think maybe we can, can end on it. Can I ask a question? Yeah, I'm of course a photographic, <laughs> a, a photographic image which has a single volunteer in a trench reading a book. He has a goatee, and he has a soft. Uh, cap on his head, not a not a helmet. And I'm I really would love to find it. I can't find it in anything published. Yeah, I'm curious. I might have to think about what sort of research strategies I would take to surface that image. But I'm happy to go on a little bit of a search for and with oh, you, Peter. <laughs> I thought I could tempt you. <laughs> Very tempting. He's anonymous. He had no name. So that's it. He's there with his cap, but reading a book. Well, see, this is good. We're all connecting and we can um, use the archives for these purposes. Um, uh, I think, okay, yeah, thank you, Peter. Uh, I think actually I'm going to ask a, a question. I'm going to let the um, 
Peter Hartzman had a question on that, on uh, the procedures of for asking access in the archives. So we might end on another Peter. Uh, Peter Hartzman, if you'd like to ask your question, you could do so now. Uh, hi, thanks very much for the uh, presentation. In the past, my, my parents were both veterans. My mother was a nurse and my father drove an ambulance. And I did get some material, uh, digital copies of material out of the Freddie Martin papers previously. But I know there's some other material there. And I was just wondering, uh, what, what information do you need in order to make a request for copies? You know, how detailed does it have to be? You know, box, folder, whatever information. Uh, so uh, that would be a good reminder to have. Yeah, thank you for that, Peter. Um, definitely the name of the collection, um, the box number at least, um, that can narrow it down a whole lot for us. If you have the folder um, number as well, that's even better. But if you can get us the collection name um, and, the, and its box, we can usually do a pretty good um, job of searching through those materials. Um, otherwise, it can start getting like the needle in the haystack, like the trying to find the person um, reading in the trench with a soft, soft cap is going to be a hard, I'm up for the challenge, but it's going to be a hard one. But yeah, if you can say um, collection name and, and box information, that can usually narrow it down quite a bit for us, and that would be really helpful. Okay, what's, what sort of turnaround times is there, or what's the process? Yeah. I mean, the, last time, the last time I made the request, I guess Michael was the was my contact. Michael Consuetz, yeah. Uh, and he uh, sent me basically a list of documents and to verify that I actually wanted the copies to be made. And I'm just, I was just curious. I mean, I was, I was basically asking, requesting things that seemed to reference my parents' hmm. names. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what. Uh... Yeah, the request time ebbs and flows depending on what the current queue, like current re reproductions queue looks like. We tend to tell people eight weeks, but sometimes it can be it can be much faster than that. Um, and we can also take expedited requests if you know that you need something at your fingertips um, uh, sooner than that. Um, you can also send me an email and I can I can do similar to what Mike had done and what I had said earlier. If you just need some quick snap, snapshots with my cell phone to confirm that the things that we're talking about are exactly what you want. Happy to do that. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Peter. And thank you everybody else for, the, for your questions. Uh, thanks again, Shannon and Peter and Danielle in absentia for uh, helping out with this. I also want to thank uh, Maria Aranda Sojeda, the vice chair and the chair of the, uh, the Alba's vice chair and the chair of the program committee for um, putting this together, and uh, Josie Jurek for being uh, such an important um, liaison between Alba and the and the Tamman Library. Um, um, I was going to say something that I forgot. Oh, yeah, I was going to just emphasize that Shannon is being incredibly generous, offering help, but it should everybody should know that. The Tamant has a small staff and they're working really hard. So if they don't attend to your requests right away, it's not because they don't want to. It's because they're just really, really, really busy. And uh, and Michael Konsowitz, who uh, has been that was there, uh, left. Um, um, and uh, we we're interviewing him in the upcoming issue of the Volunteer, and he he was great to have there. But there's one one less person there to attend to your requests. So keep that in mind. Um, Thank you, everybody, for coming. It was uh, great to see you all and to hear such, uh, such inf have a, such an informative, practical meeting that was yet touching. Um, regardless, um, just to remind you, uh, if you feel compelled to donate to Alba, we won't say no. We are a nonprofit, and your donations are tax deductible. Um, you can also use the the donation envelope in the volunteer that should land in your mailboxes in the next couple of weeks. We just sent it to the printer. If you do not currently receive volunteer and would like to do so, uh, please send an email to info at alba-valve.org um, and um, sign up for our mailing list. And uh, 
just keep an eye on your email um, for uh, upcoming events. Um, what is the closest upcoming event I may be announcing, Mark and Dennis? I forget. Nothing yet, or? Yes, yes. Hi. On June 20th, um, we have a, a event marking the Pride Month, and it will be Noelle Vallis discussing her new book, Lorca After Life. So that'll be on June 20th. So please make a note of it. We do, we, do we have the time yet for that, Mark? I believe it's three in the afternoon. Uh, Eastern time. Yeah. June Great. 20th. Thank you so much. Well, thanks again, Mark and Dennis, and thanks everybody, and uh, have a great rest of your Wednesday afternoon. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye.